But you know, Red, I've come to think of humanity as at the mouth of a very long, very dark tunnel, and right at the end is a little star shining, and that's hope. But it's no good sitting, wondering, you know, when's that star coming? No, you've got to. Uh, I don't know quite what the biblical expression, gird your loins, is, but I love it. Gird, you've got to gird your loins, roll up your sleeves, and crawl under, climb over, work around all the obstacles that lie between us and the star. Welcome to the Manga Bay Newscast. I'm your co-host, Mike DiGirolamo, bringing you weekly conversations with experts, authors, scientists, and activists working on the front lines of conservation, shining a light on some of the most pressing issues facing our planet, and holding people in power to account. This podcast was edited on Gadigal land. Today on the newscast, we host eminent primatologist and conservation icon, Dr. Jane Goodall, who is celebrating her 90th birthday this week. Goodall, who is a longtime supporter of Monga Bay and a member of its advisory council, sits down with Monga Bay founder and editor-in-chief Rhett Butler and shares reflections, lessons, and inspirations from her long and continuing career, including how she came to study chimpanzees, the significance of her pioneering research on animal behavior, the importance empathy plays in shaping how humans protect ecosystems, and how one can remain hopeful in the face of adversity. It's a fantastic discussion, and I hope you enjoy the conversation. All right, well, Jane, it's always wonderful to see you. Thank you for coming and visiting. Um, you just came from Carmel, so uh, you had a, a very special birthday s- celebration there. Can you, can you tell me a little bit about it? It was, you know, this is my 90th birthday year, so the celebrations all around the world, most of them, their galas and things which I really don't like. But this one in Carmel, 90 dogs for my 90th birthday. And it was meant to be a salute on the beach. And of course, it, it unwound itself kind of just the way it happened. And um, it was just magic. All these dogs, I would say more than half off leash, running in the sea, uh, greeting them all. And uh, yeah, it was magical. That's really nice. And um, tomorrow you're having another birthday celebration? Tomorrow is the, is the big uh, event. And of course, Charlie Knowles, who you know very well, the star founder of WCN, uh, he arranged the dogs. He arranged a big talk at the school in Carmel. And um, he's, he's arranging the, the dinner in tomorrow night. And um, just remind folks, though, what the Legacy Foundation is focused on? Well, the Legacy Foundation, you know, we've got 25 Jane Goodall Institutes around the world in different countries. Uh, and we got our youth program, Roots and Shoots, in seven countries. We have JGI Global, which is making sure that all the different chapters, you know, follow the same mission and also sharing information. The Legacy Foundation is separate from the JGIs, and it's to build up an endowment so that when I die, I know there's money to keep the things I've fought for all my life going. So the endowment will be to give grants to the different JGI roots and shoots as they need it. Or there's never a plan that the Legacy Foundation will support one of the organizations, but will chip in if there's a problem. Makes sense. Well, that's great. I hope, uh, hope tomorrow night's a big success. Um, so you've been obviously working in the field for, for quite a number of years. What, what would you say is kind of the biggest change in the conservation sector since you got started? Well, there's two big changes. One is there's more people aware. There's more little NGOs sprung up to tackle different problems. But the other change is in you know, the harm that we've done to the natural world, the forests that are disappearing, the loss of biodiversity. So it's kind of, yes, people are more aware. And the big problem is that when people read too much of the doom and gloom, which we need to know about, which is real, but if they read too much about it, they kind of give up, like, what's the point? There's no good. 
So to give people hope is a, a very important message. Yes, on that front, uh, eco anxiety is a is a big issue these days, especially among younger people. So, how do you keep hopeful, and what is the message that you give, especially younger audiences? So how do I keep hopeful? Um, because <clears throat> as I'm traveling 300 days a year around the world, which of course is this is not environmentally good because of all the emissions from planes, etc. But as nobody's given me a magic carpet. And as I think I need to be there to actually talk to people, I think that our Roots and Shoots groups, um, they're planting hundreds of thousands of trees, and I hope, and, and JGI is protecting forests. So anyway, as I go around the world, I'm meeting incredible people doing amazing things. I'm seeing forests protected. I'm seeing forests and woodlands restored. I'm meeting people who tackle what seems impossible and won't give up. And, you know, bringing endangered species that are on the brink of extinction back, like the California condor, for example. I mean, I remember vividly when there were just 12, one in captivity and 11 wild, and they caught the 11 wild ones, they did captive breeding. And now there's what, it's over 200, isn't it? I'm not sure, but it, yeah, I mean, there's definitely... Flying wild. I think it's 220 or something like that. I mean, that is a really amazing story. Um, so I guess like, you know, part, part of overcoming sort of anxiety, is, I think, is feeling like you have agency to make a difference in the world. Um, what is something that sort of like the normal person can do in their everyday life to have a positive impact? Well, I think if people begin to realize that every day they live, they make some kind of impact. And they begin to think about their own environmental footprint. And they begin to ask questions about what they buy. Was it, when it was made, was it harmful to the environment? Was it cruel to animals like the factory farms? Is it cheap because of unfair wages or slave labor? And then don't buy it. So it might cost you a little bit more to buy something that's ethically produced. But if it costs a little bit more, you will value it more and you will waste less. And as you know only too well, human waste is a huge, huge problem. So basically the message is just remember everybody, every day you live, you make an impact, choose wisely. Uh, and sometimes uh, we need to sort of move uh, people who are sort of higher up the food chain. So political leaders and business leaders. So, so, so how would the average person in their daily life sort of get their message to those kind of people? Well, I think it depends. I'm not sure who the average person is. Okay. But people have, you know, different ways of operating. Um, there are campaigns, petitions, things that one can sign. Um, I always hope that our youth program, you know, many of of the young people's parents are in decision-making positions. And I know that youth can influence uh, older people. It's happened again and again. And you, uh, you're about to embark on a new campaign looking at um, how people can exercise their vote in yeah. terms of influencing things. Could you, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I gather that there are um, 50 countries around the world that are having elections, not all presidential, but elections. And, you know, I know for a fact that a lot of particularly young people don't want to vote because they don't particularly care about anybody who's out there. They don't feel that there's any use voting for anybody. So I think the main message is your vote matters. Please go and vote and just pick the candidate who cares about the future. That's the key message. But your vote matters. Please, please vote. That's an important message, especially you know here in the United States, we're having a big election this year. Um, this is kind of a weird question, but uh, if you could establish a new global tradition or annual event where everyone in the world would participate to foster deeper connection to nature and wildlife, like what would you envision that being? Like how could you bring people together and sort of like what would you envision an event being? Say that question again. 
Well, so if, if you were looking for a way to sort of like rally people around the idea of protecting wildlife through an event or some other mechanism, is, is there something you have in mind or you would envision? Well, I think, you know, the important thing, people will never really rally around to protect nature unless they understand it, unless they experience it. And that's why getting um, children involved as early as you possibly can. And I've seen the result, you know, and there are so many stories of young people who they've been maybe in the inner city. They haven't had a chance to get their hands in the earth. They haven't had a chance to see what's in a river or a stream. And so if you can manage to find a way for them to experience nature firsthand. And, you know, the interesting thing is that more and more studies coming out to show that being in nature is beneficial psychologically and, um, and physically. So in Canada and Japan, and maybe other countries, but those two I know, doctors can prescribe time in nature. And so when you think about that, that's kind of fascinating. And it just shows that this era now with AI and cell phones and social media and our children are getting more and more of like, you see them going through a beautiful place and they're just looking fixated on their, you know, social media or whatever it is. And that's shocking. And that's what we try with our Roots and Shoots program. We try to get them out into nature without their cell phones. Difficult. Yeah, I mean, it's really a different world. I mean, the reason I started Manga Bay was really because I had those experiences out in nature and certainly harder these days. Um, so, I mean, this is kind of maybe a weird question, but I'll, I'll try to ask it. Um, to what do you credit people's interest in you and your work? Well, to start with, it was young girl going out into the forest when no other young girls did and the studying chimpanzees, it was kind of like, you know, the geographic, etc., made it beauty and the beast, you know, black, black creatures in the jungle and young girls, fair haired and everything. And that just captured people's attention. That was a good start for me. And then this, I mean, there's two Janes, Rhett, this one talking to you now, just me, you know, just but then there's an icon that's built up by geographic and discovery and media and blah, 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 whatever. And um, this Jane has the job keeping up with the icon. And it's because, you know, I can't get through an airport now. So you ask me, what is it? I'm honestly not sure. Maybe you can tell me, can you? I mean, I think it's, I think it's your your origin story, but then the fact that you moved from being a researcher to being an advocate for, for wildlife and animals, and especially conveying the idea that animals are a lot like us. They have emotions, they have feelings, um, which, you know, wasn't, I mean, as you know, it was on a mainstream idea when you started promoting it and people, you know, maybe ridiculed for you or criticized you for it, but now the world's kind of caught up to your thinking. So I think people recognize that and appreciate it and the fact that you're out there every day uh meeting with people and giving them hope about about what could easily be seen as a doom and gloom sort of space so i mean that would be my my take on it i think but it's you know for me it's um i've never really i can't reconcile what's happened uh, really i don't truly understand it but i will make use of it it's useful for the effort to save the planet if people care about you and therefore want to listen to what you say. Because I think the message I have is a good message. And you wouldn't be talking to me now if you didn't agree. So I I don't know, it's it's very, very strange to me that I can reach a child. I mean I've just come from a school. I can reach little children of six, but also adults, um, a lot of politicians, people who you might think wouldn't want to listen, do. And it's a magic. And it, Rhett, it's a gift. Like I was given 
two gifts that enable me to do this. Well, I'll give them more, but two. One, it's good genes that make me healthy. I mean, I, mean, I can still do this at 90. But the other one is a gift of communication. Writing, which I always wanted to do. Speaking, which I was terrified of until I found that I could do it. And right at the beginning, I made a vow with my family. I said, I've got to give this talk. I really, you know, I'll never say um and uh, because I don't like listening to people who say um every few seconds. And I don't. People are afraid of being silent. So I guess to build off that a little bit, uh, and I just did an um, <laughs> uh, what, would you, what would you say you most want to be remembered for? Two things. One, starting roots and shoots and giving people hope, especially young people, and getting young people involved in the natural world. Secondly, uh, because... When Louis Leakey, my mentor, told me I had to get a degree, he said, Jane, I picked you, and this was back in 1957, I picked you to study chimps because you hadn't been to university and your mind had not been uh, contaminated by the very reductionist opinion of uh, the science back then towards animals. But now I want scientists to take you seriously. So... You have to get a PhD, and um, we don't have time for an undergraduate degree. I've got your place in Cambridge University to study uh, ethology. Well, I didn't know what ethology was, uh, study of behavior, but I hadn't been to college. So I was nervous, and imagine how I felt when all these erudite professors told me I'd done everything wrong. Chimpanzees? You shouldn't name them. You should give them numbers. You can't talk about their personality. You can't talk about them having a mind capable of, of um, you know, making decisions, solving problems. You absolutely can't talk about them having emotions like happiness, sadness, fear, despair. Those are all unique to humans. That's how they thought. But I'd had this wonderful teacher when I was a child, my dog. You can't have a dog, a cat, a rat, a, a bird, or I don't care what, and not know we're not the only sentient, sapient beings on the planet. And because the chimps are biologically so like us, like we share 98.7% of the composition of DNA, and because their behavior is so like ours, kissing, embracing, holding hands, uh, patting one another, Males competing for dominance, standing upright, swaggering, shaking a fist, you know, lips bunched in a furious skull. They remind you of some male politicians, right? Really? And, you know, the long childhood, the, the um, observational learning, as well as experience, of course. So gradually, uh, science had to change its attitude. And once chimps had opened the door, Okay, we're not the only sentient sapient beings. That opened the door to all the others. And so now, you know, we're studying, finding out about the intelligence of rats and pigs and the octopus, not just elephants, whales, and dolphins. So it, I, I think it's the most exciting time for young people wanting to learn more about animal behavior that there's ever been. Yeah, it's been really incredible. I mean, you mentioned the octopus. I feel like there's been a revolution around octopus in the past decade. My octopus teacher, I just spent half a day with Craig Foster. What an amazing man he is. Yeah, I mean, I, I've never met him, but I mean, that, that the story was incredible, but then also just what he had to go through to, to make that, that film. I know. That water, amazing. I see. I just, he took me to the beach from which he set off every day to meet his octopus. We didn't go into the sea. No. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, 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 that was just uh, an incredible film. I, when I saw it, I just couldn't believe that someone had made it. So. And you heard about Pig Casso, Pig Who Paints? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, well, Pig Casso, I was going to meet her. I've been dying to meet her for five years. She died one day before I went there. Oh, that's tragic. It was so sad, but... 
you know, you can watch video of her. And I met, I met Picasso's nephew. And I said, were you upset that a pig was kind of, you know, pig casso? He said, no, I love it. Sorry. Um, so turning to conservation generally, is there an underappreciated or overlooked area that you feel like if it got more attention or was addressed, it could have a major impact in the world? Well, more and more of these things are coming into, you know, coming into the mainstream, like corridors, the importance of wildlife corridors, either small ones and letting, I mean, just a simple thing like letting natural vegetation grow along the side of roads and re greening, urban, urban greening. That's, that's becoming more and more talked about. And then there's, you know, permaculture and regenerative agriculture. People understanding that this industrial farming is killing the soil. It's harming biodiversity when it comes to farming animals. It's horribly cruel. And that this industrial farming is producing masses and masses of CO2 and methane. Uh, people are beginning to realize these things. But the killing of the soil is something I think a lot of people don't, haven't really they haven't grasped the importance of soil. So, uh, what, do you, what do you think? Because I'm interested. What, what aspects do you think? Well, I, I think linking, linking conservation and protecting nature to the benefits they afford humans, I think, unfortunately, that's how a lot of decisions get made. And I feel like there's been a lot of progress in that over the past decade, especially. But things like water, so the fact that a healthy, productive, healthy and productive eco, uh, forest provides water that feeds agriculture. So again, I mean, it's very it's kind of sort of reduction as it just focuses on that one value of an ecosystem. But I think ultimately, if you're if you're trying to engage business people and politicians, that's what they tend to listen to. Um, and so, as the data and the science gets better, and sort of you know shows these links and you know the, the value that these ecosystems provide, you know, assuming that they're healthy and productive. You know, it just creates more incentive to protect. And I think it also kind of broadens the constituency for protecting nature. But I was kind of curious as to whether you think that greater empathy for animals, for example, or or plants, you know, is, is sort of like an overlooked, I mean, if not conservation. Yes, I think it's important. And now we've got all these, you know, knowing that forests can communicate under the ground through the through the microfungi and um, send out pheromones so that they can better adjust to a on, on, on approaching attack by some kind of, you know, predator on the trees. Um, this, this is fascinating, and more and more people are beginning to understand that. And I think empathy for, well, I just have empathy for trees. I love trees, and I feel really sad when forests are cut down especially the old growth forests, but empathy for animals. That was another thing I was told when I went to Cambridge. You cannot be a scientist if you have empathy for your animals because you cannot be objective. And that's not true. It's absolutely not true. You can be completely objective and still have empathy. Don't you agree? Oh, yeah, I agree. Yeah. But I think something else, I think, People don't really understand how much we depend on the natural world uh, for food, for air, for water, all the rest of it. And but what we depend on is a healthy ecosystem, that complex mix of plants and animals, everyone with a role to play. And um, I see that as like tapestry. And so each species is like a thread in this tapestry, and they're all interdependent. So as you pull out a thread, uh, as a species disappears, and then you pull out another thread, and you pull out, in the end, the tapestry hangs in tatters, and the ecosystem collapses. And that's what's happening, and that's what we depend on, healthy ecosystem. Building off this with changing the subject slightly, do you know the X Prize? Do I know? The X Prize? So the X Prize is something where they announce a challenge and they put up 
several million dollars for people to try to solve the, the problem. No, I didn't know about that. Okay, well, it's, it's pretty interesting. They have currently one that's looking at Rainforest X Prize. So the whole idea is how do we sort of inventory an ecosystem or a rainforest to understand how many species are present and their role in the ecosystem and all that. So how it works basically. And so it's using a variety of technology and indigenous knowledge. Anyway, they, they apply this approach to different problems, but I'm on the committee to, to help pick the next prize. And last year when we met, one of the ideas that was put forth was this animal communicator, which was kind of an interesting concept, but it was like, um, you know, as soon as you understand what animals are saying, it's probably kind of obvious. It's like, don't destroy my habitat, don't eat me, you know, things like that. But one of the things that the, the advocates for this idea advanced was that if you unlock kind of what animals are saying or thinking, it's like a whole new branch of philosophy that, that you know, could inform sort of human behavior. And so that was something I hadn't thought about before, but it was kind of interesting. I'm not sure where I'm going with this, but uh, I don't know <laughs> what you just said reminded me of it. So yeah. throwing it out there, but kind of, kind of, kind of interesting concept. Well, it, you know, it does make sense when you, when you realize that complicated communication between dolphins, for example, it's amazing. And God, I mean, I'm still, I sort of seem to read something new every day about the intellect of animals, the, the, the amazing ways they communicate. And uh, it's just fascinating. And how anybody can go out to shoot uh, an endangered species that's as beautiful as an elephant. How can, how can this be? So this is why for me, Roots and Shoots, creating that empathy and understanding of animals is so important. So important. Yeah. And I feel like kids are more receptive to that whole idea of being empathetic to animals and, and plants and other organisms. But a lot of adults too. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. Yeah, a lot of after a lecture, I've had adults come up to me or write to me and say, you know, you've made me think differently. I've, uh, you've changed my life. You've changed the way I think about animals or nature. Yeah. So, I mean, on that front, I mean, do you kind of have like, do you have a, a guiding principle that you've kind of carried through your life and work that you would convey to people? Or is respect. It like respect for other species, respect for other people. Respect for people and uh, other animals and the environment. Yeah, I like that a lot. Respect's that's, very important. I like that a lot too, because that's exactly my guiding principle. So I appreciate that. Um, so the conservation space has this reputation of not being very collaborative sometimes, at least between certain big NGOs. What do you, what do you think, like, why do you think those barriers exist? And, and what do you think could be done to sort of make them play better together? Well, I think that the NGOs are competitive and uh, they don't want to work with another NGO in case they help that other NGO get more money than they do. But you know, Red, I've come to think of humanity as at the mouth of a very long, very dark tunnel. And right at the end, there's a little star shining, and that's hope. But it's no good sitting, wondering, you know, when's that star coming? No, you've got to. Uh, I don't know quite what the biblical expression, gird your loins, is, but I love it. Gird, you've got to gird your loins, roll up your sleeves, and crawl under, climb over, work around all the obstacles that lie between us and the star. There's climate change, loss of biodiversity, poverty. Because people in poverty destroy the environment to survive. Uh, killing of the soil, industrial agriculture, um, fossil fuel burn, you know, go on and on and on and on. Good news, there's people working on every single one of the problems. But as you say, the sad thing is they're so often working in silos. And I think one could suggest many examples, but the one that's so simple a group of people are really excited because they've shut down a coal mine. All those CO2 emissions won't be going into the environment. But they haven't thought about the people who lose their jobs, who fall into poverty, may destroy the environment to survive. But there are groups of people teaching alternative ways of making a living when an industry closes down. So if your coal mining group had reached out to them, then it would be win-win-win situation. 
Yeah, we definitely need more of that. Um, so I guess my, my last question would be, I mean, you're such a wonderful storyteller. Is there a story that you haven't told very often or haven't told in a while that you would want to tell? Oh, golly, what story? Well, there's a story I love about Roots and Shoots. And it was the first group in the Democratic Republic of Congo, DRC, where JGI has an office in the eastern part, Goma, which is where all the minerals are. So there's always conflict, you know, different militia come in. And so this little group of young people, they were sort of 10 to 12. And uh, for their first project, they'd seen a hill and they were told that hill used to be sacred and covered in trees. And now most of the trees have gone. So they want to put the trees back. So their mentor, Dario, uh, realized that, well, it's much bigger than the children think, but he didn't want to damp their enthusiasm. So he got a forester friend to donate some little saplings. Then he had to go to the resident militia and he asked the head guy, you know, was this okay? And he said, well, it's stupid, but I suppose there's no harm in it, but you'll have to take soldiers with you. So you imagine these 15 little children clutching their saplings, and I suppose something to dig with. And it's a long journey, much longer than they thought, and it's hot. When they get there, the ground is hard. And with them, four big Congolese soldiers with AK-47s over their shoulders. And so after about... 10, 15 minutes, the youngest, this little girl, she's about nine, she starts to cry. And a little while after that, one of the soldiers leans his gun against a tree and goes to help her. And within the next 15 minutes, all the soldiers have left their guns and they're helping the children plant trees. And to me, this is so symbolic of what we're trying to do because, you know, we can't solve all the environmental problems while people are fighting each other. Yeah, that's a really powerful story. Well, great. Well, thank you. I mean, again, if there's anything else you, any other message you want to get out or any other questions you want me to ask you? I think the main thing is for everybody to understand that every day we live, we make an impact and to choose wisely the impact we make. Isn't that the best? Yeah, I, mean, I completely agree with you. Yeah. I mean, some people can make a huge impact, depends who you are, but everybody can make some impact. And people tend to think, oh, well, you know, I pick up some litter, so what? But if it was just one person, it wouldn't make any difference, but it's hundreds and thousands of people picking up litter. Yeah. Well, thank you again for, for visiting and speaking with me and Happy birthday. It's, it's just a, and huge congratulations on where you brought Mongo Bay because honestly, I always turn to it. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's been wonderful to have your, your support over the years. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's just been amazing to see how it's grown. Well, so. Mongo Bay is truly an amazing organization and everybody should turn to it when they want to know the truth. Well, thank you again. I, I, I always love to see you. Thank you, Red. Excited to see you again a few more times this year. If you want to read more about Jane Goodall and Manga Bay coverage of her work, please find more information via the link provided in the show notes. As always, if you're enjoying the Manga Bay newscast or any of our podcast content, like our sister series, Manga Bay Explores, and you want to help us out, we encourage you to spread the word about the work we're doing by telling a friend. Word of mouth is definitely the best way to help expand our reach, but you can also support us by becoming a monthly sponsor via our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Manga Bay. Did you know Manga Bay is a nonprofit news outlet? So even just a dollar per month helps make a difference and helps us offset production costs and hosting fees. So if you're a fan of our audio reports from Nature's Frontline, head to patreon.com forward slash Manga Bay to learn more and support the Manga Bay newscast and all of our podcast content. You and your friends can join the listeners who have downloaded the Manga Bay newscast well over half a million times by subscribing to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts from, 
or you can download our app for Apple and Android devices. Just search either App Store for the Manga Bay Newscast app to gain fingertip access to new shows and all of our previous episodes. And you can also read our news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline at mangabay.com, or you can follow us on social media. Find Manga Bay on our accounts on LinkedIn at Manga Bay News, on Instagram, Threads, Blue Sky, Mastodon, Facebook, and TikTok, where our handle is at Manga Bay, or on YouTube at Manga Bay TV. Thank you, as always, for listening.